it's so exciting because this month is book launch month at the end of November we're actually going to be having a virtual book launch event which will give people a chance to get involved with some lonely conservationist activities uh, chat a bit about the book ask me any questions you want um, and there's also a chance to win one of two copies of the book um, which I will personally send to you with much love and affection <laughs> so if you would like to come celebrate with me uh, for the release of my book you can join me at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time on Saturday evening the 21st of November um, so yeah of course it's virtual so anybody can come along it is free so if you would like more details check out the website or you can always sign up to be a member to get this information delivered straight to your inbox so yeah i can't wait to celebrate with you then but until then let's get straight into the podcast hello and welcome to how to conserve conservationist the podcast for conservationists and non-conservationists i'm jesse you're here with todd and We're going to talk about episode 9, which is about chapter 9 of the book, gloriously titled Everybody Poops. Is this a reference to a song or lyric or... No, just (laughs) stating the obvious. It was actually called something else. I was thinking when I was writing this chapter, I was thinking of that Billie Eilish song, like, you should see me in a crown. And I was like, nah. And then I was like, you can't see me from my throne. But then the last minute I changed it to everybody poops <laughs> <laughs> we've gone from royalty to pooping but yeah. that is because this week we're talking about glorification and its impact on the conservation industry and I think conservation is rife with glorification which causes a lot of issues um, but one is actually that I had no idea that anybody else was suffering in the industry because of glorification and so my whole life I didn't know that burnout, imposter syndrome, all the things we've been talking about in this podcast actually impacted conservationists because it was never talked about. Because all you see in the industry is like your David Attenboroughs, your Jane Goodalls, your Steve Owens, and you don't really see the day-to-day struggles or meetings or like just the realities of the of the industry on social media or in the general media. I still refuse to believe David Attenborough has a rough life. I mean, like... He looks too chill. He's old, though. He's, like, 90-something now. He's in his 90s, or he is 90. Yeah, he should be retired, but the world keeps getting worse, so he can't afford to. Poor David. I guess that's his own struggle, isn't it? Yeah. But, I mean, my um, lecturer, when I did my undergrad, my lecturer worked with him. He was helping... He wanted to film, or his team wanted to film a bit about... um, My lecturer's team worked on lizards... And they, there was a lizard that they thought was extinct, but they found one in the belly of a snake, which means that it must have existed because the snake had recently eaten Close it. Close call, unfortunately. All, all of them are dead now, for sure. No, so they, so they set up a little sanctuary or this wave conservation effort to track them down and protect them and to start this like conservation hub. The lizard is a pygmy blue tongue lizard, okay. Australian species. And so David and his team came down to film it. And my lecturer said that my lecturer was the nicest guy ever. And he said David was the nicest guy ever. And at the time, all he wanted to do was drink red wine and eat red meat. But now he campaigns a lot for reducing meat consumption. So I think some things have changed since then. But apparently he was just very patient and a very lovely guy in person. How can he not be? So we love David. If David's listening, (laughs) I'll probably die. But... We love you, David. <laughs> or is it... So this chapter you're saying that uh, glorifying people isn't good, though. Yeah, but... That thing you just did. But I had, I had like, actual evidence from somebody that he's a genuinely good person. It's not like he's been unjustly glorified. He's not right? like uh, Ellen, who turns out is, like, a total monster to everyone backstage. Even on stage, honestly. See, like, if your perception of someone is correct, is that glorification? <laughs> glorification <laughs> means that you glorify something to be better than it is but what if mm. he just is that good <laughs> <laughs> but 
But to be honest, I don't really glorify anybody in the conservation industry anymore because I have had opportunities to work with some of the most renowned conservationists. Uh, you know, like there's renowned conservationists in everybody's bubble. And like, for instance, my, the lecturer I was talking about, Mike Ball, who recently passed away, he was so influential in um, herpetology. And people that I know from America knew who he was because of his papers. So I think because circles in conservation are so small, you can be like a normal dude that's like normal to someone, but someone overseas or somebody else could like really think, wow, this guy is the bee's knees. He works <laughs> with bees and he studies their knees. <laughs> But basically, I think after working with a lot of people who I have seen people swoon over, put themselves out for, cry because they met them, after actually just working with them and living my life with them, it's like, oh, they're just a normal person. And I've kind of seen how detrimental it can be to glorify a person instead of the conservation effort itself. Mm, it's a bit of a personality cult almost yeah. you could turn it into. I heard something the other day. The, I heard something the other day, um, which I'm interested to hear your opinion on. Somebody said, "Would conservation be better if it was an anonymous industry?" I mean, probably not. The only anonymous thing I've heard of is 4chan, and that's pretty bad. <laughs> it's pretty horrific. It doesn't work well. I guess what this person's argument was is that if you reduced the need for egos or competition or publicity mm. how much more amazing conservation work would get done if there wasn't the fight for media presence or like look at me i'm publishing this paper or i'm in this documentary or i'm doing this it's um it does yeah just as someone not in it it does seem like a, a lot of people doing it they do seem to do it for like putting their name attached to it or even just like sort of a loose academia relationship where, oh, I have to have my name on the paper and like now I have a hundred papers and that makes me the best scientist. Conservationists might be like, well, I did this and I started this project and it saved a hundred bees and now I'm the best. Do you think it's because we don't get paid very well that people need some kind of gratification? So sometimes like the glory of doing something important and having that recognized is what we aim for because we're not getting paid. So that's why some people strive to be like Instagram famous or like strive to have known efforts because they're just mm. not getting any financial satisfaction. Yeah. I don't think at a, I would assume at a personal level, it's not even about them wanting to be famous and conservation. It's just a method of doing it. I think they do care about getting the work done, but they also, if only they know, it feels like you've just wasted your time. Mm. You, like, you want the whole world to know that you saved a hundred bees. I do. I have heard that a lot, that I, a lot of people on Instagram want to grow the page because they are interested in science communication and the more followers they have, the more they consider themselves to be spreading their message. Mm. For me, that's problematic because the, um, the what is it called? The algorithm of Instagram means that you're only really communicating with like a fifth of your followers. So the smaller your followers are, like the fewer your followers are, the more impact you're having. And I've seen that with the growth of Lonely Conservationists. Is I never wanted it to get big because I wanted it to have a bigger impact to a smaller amount of people. Like now the page has reached 4,000 followers. I'm not reaching all of those people. Like Instagram does not allow that to happen. Instagram sounds terrible. <laughs> I, <think laughs> I don't use it. All social media has its benefits. It's got its own little like quirks of everyone calls it the algorithm. <laughs> but it's just like the rules of what gets shared. And now it's not even only likes that matter. You have to save and share something to like get its... Um, what is it called? Like engagement up? Yeah. Well, they want like only the most interesting things in front of people's eyeballs so yeah. that their eyeballs stay on it. The pressure. The pressure to be interesting. So you have to be the most interesting thing on the fucking earth <laughs> in that moment. It's so fascinating because when I think of glorification, I just have this image of when I was going to Indonesia the first time, I'd had no idea who this primate scientist was. But the PhD student that was coming with me was basically like crying and so excited to meet this guy. And then I met him. I'm like, oh, yeah, he's just a guy. 
and then I hear some like not so great things about him while I stay in Indonesia working and then Todd just meets him and hangs out with him and like Todd is basically meeting and hanging out with and living his life with like some of the biggest conservationists in Indonesia and he's just like yeah whatever but because Todd is outside of the industry and not hyping them up and just being real with them some of the conservationists were like oh I'm just only working with um, primates because that's where all the hype is like I really <laughs> I used to work with um, reptiles and I miss working with reptiles we were very drunk at a pub and I was like man I've, we went, we just recently looked at like wild quote uh, orangutans and I was like man they're pretty much just like koalas which is sacrilegious to say but they're not the most interesting animal they just sit in a tree and eat leaves and you look at this orangutan it's like oh they're so smart they're so intelligent and they're just like humans and they're just amazing and they're just sitting there eating leaves and like oh, it doesn't impress me wildly <laughs> and yeah these like orangutan scientists who spent 30 years studying them are like yeah that's, I'm a bit sick of them <laughs> I could I could choose to study something else if I had the option. Objectively, though, like macaques are way more interesting than orangutans in terms of watch value. Are they those little monkeys? Yeah, the ones that yeah. like monyet nakal, naughty monkeys. <laughs> That's what what the locals call them. <laughs> you have like different types of macaques: pigtail macaques, long and short tail macaques. But no matter what ones you have, they are always a hundred percent way more interesting to watch than orangutans because they go around in groups. And they're like, they're pretty much like a, a really ratty boys <laughs> club of being little dicks to each other constantly. The first time I ever experienced macaques is when my dad took me, I must have been in year 12. He took me to Malaysia and he took me to a um, place in Borneo where they released orangutans, but they had the option to come back every day to feed if they wanted to. So they would put food out and if these wild orangutans wanted to come back for food they could if they wanted to disappear into the forest they could um so we were watching them on this platform while the orangutans were eating but as soon as they buggered off the big male big macaque would come <laughs> and he tried to defend all the food stocks for himself but it turned into a game of like capture the flag where every man and his dog was trying to get that food but they were employing such amazing tactics like teaming up together to trick this alpha male yeah. macaque hey, into, look over like, here. distracting him Yoink. yeah and then so you'd have this like female seducing him and then you'd have this little <laughs> baby sticking its hand up between the like gap in the in the like planks of wood and like drawing the food down from underneath and it was just so incredible and that was like the takeaway of my trip like it was my lifelong dream to go see these orangutans but i came back with the macaques <laughs> yeah that was definitely my experience as well when we went there. Not to say that macaques are amazing, fantastic, because when I was working in Thailand, it took me two hours to outsmart two macaques. <laughs> and it really humbled me <laughs> because I, I think I respected monkeys more than... And I, there's a problem because apes are like so smart that they know they're smart and they don't want to waste their time just proving that to you. Yeah, they're Mon a bit above it all. Monkeys prove their smartness constantly <laughs> and when i was working in thailand there was these like enclosures for these like rehabilitated monkeys and we had to i had to clean out both sides of the enclosure so i had to lock them in one side clean out the other and then lock them in the opposite side and clean out the other one so i managed to clean out one side spent two hours trying everything to get them in the other one bribery like spraying them with water <laughs> monkey chow like anything i can think of after two hours i'd given up my boss was like no you can't finish the day until you clean the other side i was like how am i going to defeat these monkeys and then i'm like okay they're not cats they're not dogs if they're primates and they're as smart as me they can get on my level so basically i ended up pretending i wanted them in the side that i already cleaned no, I pretended I wanted them in the dirty side. And then they're like, ha ha, we're going to the other side. And I slammed the door shut. I literally had to use reverse psychology on these macaques. I was going to say, it sounds like they knew what you wanted. And that was enough for them to immediately go against it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like, macaques are great because they test your own skills. It's like they are a puzzle. Um, <laughs> I can understand the perception of orangutans being a bit blase to people they just sit there eating leaves but the truth is 
uh, orangutans are bringing in the money, they're bringing in the media. Macaques are not doing that because they're really common and their population is frequent around the world. So if you want the money, if you want the media attention, you got to get into orangutans. That's where it is. <laughs> I guess so. The problem is that I have is also this level of competition where in Indonesia there was basically like five organizations working towards orangutan conservation. But imagine if those five organizations were one organization who pulled resources, communicated, shared data. Like, why across the board in conservation are we competing for resources instead of collaborating? Like, that's ridiculous to me. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing to me that there was like multiple orangutan ch- charities. Is that the right term for it? NGOs. NGOs. Yeah. And they had like, they, they weren't arch enemies. But they had like, you know, an intricate drama and history between each other. They weren't best friends. My opinion is that if glory and media attention and money wasn't a factor and it was purely the conservation efforts that mattered, mm. then why? What, what is stopping everyone from banding together to achieve a common goal of conserving the ranking? Well, that makes me think of a story I heard on youtube which i'm gonna butcher further and misconstrue it but there was like a elephant sanctuary Mm -hmm. run by locals in some kind of southeast asian country i don't know where elephants are and they did the typical like yep we'll just uh train the elephants to do tricks and we'll let people ride their backs because that's what get the money in and there was a bunch of like white people westerners they set up their own elephant sanctuary where they just let them roam free and do their own thing. And like, if you want to come visit, you can maybe feed them an apple if you're really lucky and the elephant likes you and decides to walk up to you, which is better for the elephant Mm -hmm. is my understanding. But it led to the, the local elephant sanctuary just starting this like massive media campaign against the other ones Mm -hmm. and saying that they were, Oh, they're really bad. Oh, you know, can you believe these white people coming in thinking they know how to run the show? There's, don't don't go to their sanctuary where the better ones. And so these Western animal, elephant sanctuary people, like, what do you do in that case apart from try to make yourselves look good? Because it's a bit of a media battle. Yeah, true. It just because just because they're doing the right thing, if they don't, you know, broadcast that loudly, people won't know, and they won't know to support them. But in my brain, I'm thinking like there needs to be a preference for the way locals can operate in a space. So it would be better for like in my brain, which I don't know how feasible this would have been, for these Westerners to go and hire actually pay the locals in the other elephant camps or pay locals in general train them to run their own sanctuary using these western methods of maybe more ethical treatment of elephants <laughs> we're not equating western with ethical ethical no but like, but like in this particular instance in this it works instance, out that way if they're saying no riding no bull hooks like they're just roaming free well they do literally make less money though yeah so if you're in it for the money it makes too much sense to let you ride the elephant. And I guess this is an issue because money is what makes the world go round. And like, if you're in a country where it's your like your livelihood is, I am a mahout, which is someone that works with elephants. Like, I'm a mahout. I need to get trained for being a mahout. I need to get paid for being a mahout. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're there to fix fences or whatever and you're getting paid half the wage because the elephants are like not really in captivity yeah if you have elephants just roaming around doing their own thing and you're just there to like make sure they're fed much anyone can do that there is marketing tactics such as some people make elephant poop into paper and sell it so i think that's what they were doing yeah i don't really want to get into an ethics debate but i think (laughs) like there is ways around like but like doing for these people doing the right thing and helping elephants wasn't enough and if they only focused on that mm-hmm. they would have gone out of business so they had to focus a lot on making themselves personally look good yeah this is i guess why i mentioned the competition before is because i think the competition and the glorification goes yeah, hand in hand exactly and i don't really want to make this like a drama channel because there's so <laughs> many instances i would love to Are you talk gonna spill about the tea? Uh, like how I think people have made 
harmful or detrimental decisions for wildlife because of the media and I'm not out to like I don't I don't it would there is some benefit in sharing these stories because I think a lot of people are not aware how glorification and media can actually detrimentally impact wildlife Mm. but at the same time I feel like the conservation space is so like rife with these stories or it's just like I don't want to get blacklisted even if I don't (laughs) mention names I feel like people could find out because like you could piece together parts of the yeah. environment or the species that I'm nah. talking about. It's it's not hard to imagine that it's a thing in the industry where people choose money over pure and anim- what best for the animal. So, for instance, because you could very easily zoom out big picture and be like, well, listen, if we don't get money to keep this operation running, you know, none of the animals are going to be okay. So, if you get into conservation for the pure, the pure like motivation of I want to conserve animals. You're an animal lover. <laughs> You're an animal lover, air quotes. <laughs> um, then later down the track, you have a very successful sanctuary. You're doing amazing wildlife rehabilitation. You get noticed. And then a media company wants to come and be like, hey, can we please do a documentary about you releasing this animal? Just say it's like a badger. We want to we <laughs> we want to document you releasing these badges, but you know in your heart that it's not the right time to release the badges. They're not fully at the end of their rehabilitation. Well, that makes me think of like the pandas in China. The China wants them to be released, and like, look how great we did. The pandas are back, but like, my understanding is the pandas will not survive in the wild. I mean, just look at them. Well, there's like a lot of things like. I think that ties into they're too habituated. They can't survive without humans. But just say you've done everything properly. They're not at the right stage of their release yet. They, I've the seen mo- them. The, <laughs> the carers they put on panda costumes not to appear as humans. <laughs> it's the best ever. You always bring up pandas. Like, Do you secretly they're the best. look at panda content in your downtime? Only. Exclusively. <laughs> Only panda content. <laughs> Back to the badgers. Badgers, okay, okay, that's our example. It's, it's the wrong season. It's like the depths of winter. I don't know enough about badgers. I don't badgers know enough to about badgers either. I, give chose, it a... I chose an animal that's so opposed to anything I've ever worked with, so nobody could tie this to like. Are badgers endangered? I don't even know. If you're a badger Probably. expert, like, let us know about badgers. How are they badgers doing? Um, I hope they're okay. Basically, if my example is like. A documentary company like the BBC are like, okay, you've got an ama- amazing badger rehabilitation project. Uh, we want you to release the badgers this week. We're only here in town this week. We want you to release them. So we can like film it. Film and it. Like, here's the badger swimming in the stream. You will get so much exposure. You will get so many donations because so many people will suddenly realize about your badger project. But because it's not the right conditions, your badgers aren't ready. It's the depth of winter. I don't know if badgers like winter or not. But <laughs> like halfway through when they're supposed to be hibernating, you're going to like release them into the wild. Yeah. You know they're going to die. Yeah. What do you do? Do you say, no, sorry, I'll deny all this donors, the, the media, because I care about these five badgers? Or do you say, I became a conservationist because I love badgers no amount of money, media attention can get me to release these badges. Yeah, the but if time. you haven't got the money, no more badges, thank you. So do you think... I, I know it's a hypothetical, but my solution would be... Well, oh, hang on, film, film crew. I know it would be a nice story arc to have. We, the badger gets injured and then we take care of it and then, oh, look at it, back in nature. What if we say, look, the environment is so, you know, deforested, degraded, wintry... That these poor little badgers, we can't even release them back into the wild because they would just die. And then you have a little shot of like the little badger behind bars in the little <laughs> cage, you know? and he's and it can be really like oh to pull your heartstrings, being like these poor badgers, they really want to be free, but because of you know reasons <laughs> that we explore in this film, they can't be. Wouldn't that be a good documentary? If anyone needs a PR or marketing campaign manager for your upcoming documentary on badgers, you yes. know who to talk to. <laughs> the trick to being a good badger sanctuary is to have documentaries come show how bad it is to be in your badger sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that might be the angle they're coming from. Well, so I've known people that have 
killed badgers. Not really. Like they have taken that <laughs> route of releasing the badgers for the media exposure, and that's really it's hard for me to hear as a conservationist that they've chosen this glory, this money, this. Like, like, as an expert in badges, they should have known better. Yeah. They, it's, it's not like, oh, you know, we, they didn't, we didn't know. There's such an angle to be like, how can we release them back into their environment when we as humans need to step up? You're right. There could be such an angle to be like, we can't release them yet. But I, I can imagine in another angle that the media company is pressuring you like we're here this week we want to release it's in our storyboard we want to release release <laughs> yeah. or nothing we've already decided the fate of this badger yeah so i think my problem is how that do you have at the end of the movie no animals are harmed in the making of this you movie don't, you can't legally you just don't include that, that but i don't know if they know it so just like the badgers might not die like the day after release they might not die a month after release. Well, that's what I mean. Like, it is a bit of a gamble, even in the best of conditions. Yeah, but like their death might not necessarily be even on the radar of the of the documentary crew. Yeah. So how did... have you seen that video where this guy apparently he had this little bird that was injured, and he like spent a month nursing it, and then it, he was just like the video of him releasing it back like into this little bush. And he's like patting it. The thing was like, like you know, close. Obviously, he could just fly away, but it was like you know, he liked him a lot. And he's like, there you go. And he put it onto a tree. And then within like three milliseconds, a cat just jumps up and grabs the bird. That's such a Simpsons thing to happen. It's yeah, like <laughs> it's horrifically tragic. That makes you laugh. It's too tragic. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I think that comes back like to that, the point. That sort of thing, that would make the documentary bad. If they release the badger within one second, an eagle picks it up and flies off. <laughs> I want to do a shout out to Angus Hamilton, Lonely Conservationist. His <laughs> Instagram is Life Gone Wild. Um, he released a documentary about Malaysia and he's filming flying squirrels and he accidentally has his light in and his headlight hits the path of the flying squirrel who gets blinded and smacks into a tree (laughs) and i think that was incredible that he left that footage in because he could have cut that out and he could have pretended like oh we did the right thing blah blah no animals were harmed in the making of this documentary (laughs) but how many people don't even think about was the squirrel okay i hope so yeah (laughs) how many people don't even think about how their presence impacts well, isn't that animal. isn't that a massive thing, especially in nature documentaries of like don't interfere? Yeah. So I so really, like shining a light to like get a good recording. I of would this never group. forget that. Like this, I guess this comes back to the failure episode where because Gus showed us his failure, yeah, it means that hopefully every single person that watched his documentary will never shine their headlight into the flight path of a flying squirrel. Now you know. And I really respected Gus for that because I think back to how glamorized the industry is you always see these beautiful shots that are all like slow-mo the whales diving out of the ocean breaching and turning well that's around. what i appreciate how often do you see a wild animal like slip or like <laughs> mess up something that feels like a very human thing to do but i just love when i see things that haven't really gone to plan talked about or shared because that just means that that's more acceptable because in the conservation industry failure happens more than success does Mm. like there is not high rates of like release success there's not high rates of rehab revegetation success because back in the day like we had enough resources to go around we didn't have to start from scratch and plant new forests again and we didn't have to like restruct the whole environment so we're learning how to do this and when i was in the incubator um program last year somebody like the ceo of the company that was running it talked about how he'd failed in an experiment and i thanked him afterwards for talking about it because i never hear people talk about when they have failed with something and for me to see this person that a lot of people looked up to and a lot of people kind of idolized and for him to sit there and say like look things are trial and error it doesn't always go perfectly to plan the first time. I really respected him for that because hopefully people realize that glorification is damaging because it doesn't paint a real picture of how to do anything. Like it's not an instruction manual of like how the world actually is, but it gives Mm. you this false impression that things have to be perfect all the time and there's no room for error. Whereas just by Gus showing the flying squirrel, 
It's like, okay, one <laughs> flying squirrel was hurt, but now because so many people saw this documentary, hopefully like so many flying squirrels are not going to be hurt now because there won't be like another Westerner keep making the same mistake every single time. <laughs> yeah. Don't go spotlight hunting for flying squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> just be careful. Always use a red light. <laughs> and just Oh yeah, I forgot that's a thing. Yeah. Um so I think glorification I really had to mention it in the book because there there is so many impacts. Um especially on social media where firstly sorry if you can hear that horn in the background. <laughs> firstly I mentioned that on social media there was no representation of the downsides of conservation because everyone has to put forward their most perfect version of themselves because there's no jobs. And if you want one of the th- few jobs that are available you have to put your most perfect self forward because okay i just have to add there's like a little bit of a jump here because halfway through when todd and i were talking this guy starts honking his horn for literally like a long time i had to cut out a lot of just him honking in a weird morse code way like i don't know because we're in lockdown if he was trying to communicate with someone via horn um but that's why it's a bit jumpy here just from cutting the horn show out is far from that because there's so much failure and just working things out it's everybody is getting such a misrepresented version of what is actually going on which is also detrimental to how we're treated because one of the comments that was really interesting when Mongo Bay published an article about lonely conservationists there was a lot of people commenting um, on the article that they had no idea conservationists experienced any hardship because of how glorified the industry is, where everyone just thought it's people going to Africa, sharing like beautiful landscapes, pictures of them working with animals. Everyone dreamed of having that life. They didn't know they were paying to be there, that they were like <laughs> so poor and living with their parents when they got back, that they were suffering from PTSD or burnout or imposter syndrome. Like people just had no idea what we're going through and that makes it even harder for us to be suffering through these things that we have talked about in the podcast because people outside think that we have no reason to complain because they're not aware of the reasons why we're suffering like if i don't want my feed filled with oh my life's so hard no i think there needs to be a balance and this right? is a ironic uh, morbid comedy twist i think it ha- everything has to be solution based so you can say like this is what I do. When I am feeling really scared or really shit about something and then I find a solution to overcome that problem, like I was in a conference, I talked about this story before, where I was really scared to go into this workshop because I had no idea about what the content of the workshop is. When I came <laughs> out of the workshop and I was like, oh my God, it's fine. It's understandable being uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I put on my Instagram story, like I was so scared to go into this workshop today, but I did it anyway. It turned out to be fine. And I realized I'd be missing out on more by being too afraid to participate in things than just not participating. Um, so then I had heaps of people messaging me like, oh my God, thank you for talking about this. I've been so scared to do this, this and this, but I'm, it's really encouraged me to just try it and I actually got a blog sent to me that was like I was too afraid to write a blog then Jessie posted about how she was scared and she overcame that fear so I've overcome my fear of submitting my story and here's my blog today so I think it's really important to talk about the shitty things but in a more solution based way like lonely conservationists started off actually it was kind of solution based in the beginning it's like okay I'm struggling I want to know how many people are struggling too if you submit your story and we share it then we can have a bigger picture about like what's actually going on. We can start to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. So a lot of cons- conservation optimism and what they do, because in when we're doing our workshop, Spencer asked Julia, like, how do you feel about conservation pessimism? Like, is there a place <laughs> for it? And she's like, you have to be realistic, right? Because nobody can tolerate things being good all the time. So you need I, to... I, I like the idea of pessimism just equating to realism. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's like, exactly. It's Realism is important because you have to have like a balanced view of things. But if you're going to be realistic about the problem, you have to provide a solution. And sometimes conservation optimism is all about having an optimistic solution. So in David Attenborough's uh, movie that came out about his witness statement, he goes on this whole story about how the pollution is rising the habitats dropping and throughout his whole life the world has got worse 
But at the end, he's like, if you want to have more resources and if you want people have to have a better quality of life, we need to educate women. We need to eat less meat. We need a blah, 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 blah. So he provided solutions, not just to return back to how things were, but to give people a better quality of life with more resources. So it's all about providing that solution. And that's where I think like when things are glorified, you're not giving anyone solutions. You're just saying, look how freaking good my life is and making everyone else feel bad. If you're being realistic and solution based, it's like, here's how you can join me in what I'm doing. <laughs> Here, let's make it approachable. Okay. <laughs> good, good monologue. Thank you. Thank you. But do, do you think looking into the conservation industry, like before being with me or even being with me, have you noticed any, any problems yourself of glorification in the industry or did you notice that it was glorified or did you just come into it like you, not really knowing what conservation was and then seeing it from my perspective so you didn't experience that glorification? I didn't really experience it. <laughs> well, yeah, so like to me, conservationist who's like possibly could be glorified as yeah, you're David Attenborough, you're Steve Irwin's. But um, I always assumed that those people who sort of bring a sort of TV media presence to all these animals and places, they're not really as effective as just having like lawyers lobbying to change laws. I'll have to disagree because I yeah so many people love wildlife and have an appreciation for wildlife because they're just day-to-day -day people like the Todds of the world who see that on TV and if they hadn't seen that on TV they wouldn't know it existed because they're not off in Africa they might not even go to the zoo that might be that might be their sole exposure to wildlife yeah so David Attenborough was the fastest growing person on Instagram he was like went from brand new to most followers ever in the shortest amount of time if that makes sense well, he already was pretty famous yeah but like he's on a brand new platform starting from zero not immensely famous he I has guess. the most followers out of anyone out of Kim Kardashian yeah, yeah out yeah. of like I don't know if Led Zeppelin's even popular <laughs> I can't think of who's the most famous person you know <laughs> the bad Led Zeppelin <laughs> But like, isn't that crazy that like no beauty guru, <laughs> no rock star, no like K-pop star, mm. so, like he surpassed everyone, Yeah. which means he's not just accessible to conservationists, he is accessible to the masses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's saying something that if you're fighting something in secret as a lawyer, you might not be having the overall impact that you do on the media, even if it is glorified. Okay. Yeah, but like those millions of people who follow David Attenborough, they're not helping. What do you mean? Do you I remember just, my very, sea star story? Do you remember my <laughs> pessimism equals realism <laughs> story? I feel like if everyone that follows David Attenborough is doing one small thing, like they're either reducing their meat intake, they are reducing plastic around the house, they are like doing citizen science, educating women. If they're doing one thing, that's going to be more than one lawyer fighting one big case. What if the case fails? Like, you know well, yeah, how they're fighting Adani and like Adani won? <laughs> so if you put all your eggs in the baskets of lawyers and governments and like influential people, that's not going to make a sustainable impact like a lot of people doing just one thing. Yeah, but like David Adver is very famous and Adani is destroying the Great Barrier Reef. Yeah. Like David can't do much about that. He could if he focused solely on Adani. <laughs> the problem is there's too many problems that he knows about that he wouldn't just yeah, be granted. like, everyone go sign a petition, go lobby for Adani coal mines. We want to save the Great Barrier Reef. That's part of the, that's part of the whole problem, right? You sort of act as if David can, can save the whole world. David can only do like a blanket saving like David is the orangutan, right? Like if you <laughs> if you save the orangutans, you're not just saving the orangutans, you're saving everything else in the forest. By getting by David getting everyone to appreciate wildlife and f for doing like some small things, just say people might latch on to different things. Like 
I've latched on to conservationists and I want to help them, but other people might latch on to earthworms and they want to protect them. Like other people, no one latches on to earthworms. I latch Can on I just earth. say, <laughs> somebody might latch on to like lizards and somebody might latch on to air quality and and everyone might explore that facet in more detail. So he's inspiring the masses, but they can choose their own path. You know. Okay. Basically. <laughs> I mean, this is my next thought. If everyone's trying to be David Attenborough and just trying to be a spokesperson and there's not a lot of people who find satisfaction in doing the anonymous groundwork, then there's a problem. Like, you can only well, have what I'm a few Davids, right? Not everyone can be a David and sometimes I feel like everyone... It almost makes David less effective if there's more Davids. Exactly. Competing Davids. <laughs> Imagine if there was, like, three Trumps. Well, he has to retire one day. <laughs> I don't think we need a retire. new David. What? Yeah, but that's. Have we got a new Steve? Yeah, like the um, Irwin family has taken over Australian Zoo, and Australian Zoo, Australia Zoo, and now Bindi and um, Bob are now taking over his legacy. I guess so. But like, that's what made Jane Goodall so effective. Is she created Roots and Shoots, and she had all these chimpanzee volunteers, um, and she made people like. She, she made a legacy. She made people act regardless of her own abilities. Whereas she was one of three trimates. There was Barute Galdakas who was selected to go look at um, orangutans and observe them. And then she was, do, uh, Jane Goodall was doing um, chimpanzees. And then Diane Fossey was out researching gorillas. Wasn't there like some, it was a weird, like artificially constructed situation with these, these three? Louis Leakey decided to send three women out to each primate, like to each of the great apes. Bonobos got lost somewhere. R.O.P. Bonobos. <laughs> um, and to observe them as three women with no scientific training or background to see just what they observed. Because women truly have the greatest insights. They do. So nobody knows who Brute Goldacus is, which means she hasn't left a legacy. <laughs> Diane Fossey unfortunately died, which, I mean, that's just tragic and... We can't blame her for not having a legacy. Yeah, okay. But Jane Goodall um, made herself a foundation, Roots and Shoots. She got volunteers, she trained them, and now she has a legacy once she's gone. So that's there's one thing to be a spokesperson, but how do you make sure your legacy lives on? And now instead of having one Jane Goodall replace her, she now has the whole Roots and Shoots foundation to replace her. So sometimes you don't even need like just one figurehead replacing another figurehead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Convince me. I've changed my mind. Good. We love when this happens. <laughs> but I, I just, I guess it's frustrating when people focus on the glory and they want to be that figurehead that the legacy doesn't matter or their work doesn't matter. Like you have to be humble in conservation to make sure that your legacy or your work actually has value, right? Because if Jane was just, if your legacy is just being famous, yeah, and people liking you. Then when Jane dies, that's gone. You haven't done much for the critters. Exactly. So I think glorification is such an issue because it, it, it's not sustainable. It like just say you want heaps of Instagram followers so you can be like the best science communicator. Sure, but once you do, you get bored of your account, you deactivate it. Then what? Like, where's your legacy? So well, true of any Instagram <laughs> fame seeking person. <laughs> So I guess you have to think about like your long-term impact. And this is my problem with glorification is that it doesn't consider any impact really, or like if any, just short-term impact. And another thing is like, I am so sick of people glorifying people because they're famous when the people I really look up to are like my field staff. Shout out to Amin and Masaru who are somewhere in Indonesia who made my field work possible and who made me feel like I was a part of the culture and like accepted into their community. And I learned so much from them that I have never learned from any influential figure or any university or like... Well, they're, yeah, they're the ones out in the field actually doing the work. Yeah, and they get no glory. Like yeah. the, the anonymous people who are doing so much for conservation are the people who I feel like I credit most of my learnings to or the, the most of my growth and who I am today. Like my, my supervisor says, 
<laughs> my honor supervisor said I could never get anywhere without using his name. Has he contributed to my knowledge of conservation? No. <laughs> Have my field staff contributed? Greatly. So I feel like we should be glorifying people more who are under glorified. So we can so balance both... the glorification, like de glorify some people and and glorify others. <laughs> Balance is good. More glorification is your... <laughs> well, I just think some people need to be hyped more. And this I've read about in the book, I think PhD students need more glorification because they're basically working, at least in Australia, under the poverty line to produce science that nobody has ever done before. Like they have to spend three to five years of their life working on really specific research and producing brand new scientific outputs but they're working below the poverty line because they're still in university. Some people just say that they're students, so they don't get really the respect that they deserve, even though they're like academics working for nothing, <laughs> peanuts. Yeah. Um, and I just think there's so many people doing such amazing work that need to be like in society, they need to be respected more. And to do that, we need to start hyping them up. I just I hope... train for PhD students. Like when you were in Indonesia, was it like the big, like famous people that you remember? Like, so Todd is obsessed with. What? Shout out Lahiri if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> he work. He's a scientist that works in the peat swamps. He's originally from Sri Lanka, but he, uh, we met him in Indonesia when we were there. Todd had this massive man crush was on Lahiri. Affiliated Lahiru. with Singapore University. Yeah. Um, and I think Lahiru shaped Todd's life more than any <laughs> big name um, scientist ever did. Oh yeah, definitely. What was it about Lahiru for you that that stood out or that like changed? Just an incredibly intelligent, passionate, knowledgeable, impressive person. <laughs> Do you think that's missing from like figureheads is you don't really get to see their knowledge and passion throughout like a scripted dialogue or like from their persona like you don't really get to see because Todd always talks about how the hero sees this bird gets out this huge bird book he'd been lugging around yeah we're <laughs> in the middle we're in the middle of a river in a in a swamp gigantic river on this tiny little dinghy for like three hours we're all just you know slogging it and he sees out in the distance, three kilometers away on the tree line, he sees a, a bird of some description and he's like, oh, pulls out of his bag, these gigantic binoculars, <laughs> has a look and he's like, I think that's a, uh, uh, g- give me a name of an eagle. Uh, like a, a fish eagle? <laughs> something, some, yeah. A partic- not just, I think that's an eagle. I think that's a, this exact Latin name, eagle. <laughs> And then just out of the same bag that like it seems like it's only a tiny little <laughs> backpack that pulls out this like six hundred page textbook about birds in this exact area, <laughs> flips immediately to the correct page. It's like, yep, yeah, is this one here? Let me add it to my scene list. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> I love how that impressed you. That impressed me greatly. Was it the Mary Poppins style bag? Oh, is it yeah, really? he. I don't know. He's carrying obviously like ten kilos of gear and just makes it look like he just has a water bottle in it. Just uh, it made everything look effortless. Meanwhile, what did you do on that boat? I died of heat stroke. So I got incredibly, incredibly burnt. That when he came back in the middle of the night, I didn't notice. But in the morning, he was very crispy. To be fair to me, they told me we're going to the forest. When I picture the forest, there's trees involved. We didn't go to the forest. We went to a river that's three kilometers wide (laughs) in a dinghy. So there's no shade whatsoever. It was rough. You learned though. Once again, though, as we're pulling out, going through this river, we go past at least two crocodiles. Might have been alligators. I don't know. They, the the those critters that eat people in the in the waters. Long reptiles. Or Long some reptiles. <laughs> they look like they would happily eat you. And then around lunchtime, we stop, and the hero is like, "Oh man, the water looks great. I might dip in for a swim." The water did not look great. It was jet black. You stick your finger in one centimeter, and you can't see it anymore. <laughs> not inviting in the slightest. And this guy just. Whipping the shirt off, jumps in. <laughs> just just you, a god among men. That's how you impress Todd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you dive into murky water with your muscles glistening in the yeah. sunshine. 
My God, what a guy. <laughs> It was so cute because when we were in Singapore and we went to a conference where he he knew Lahiru was at, like Lahiru would see me in the lecture theater and be like, oh, say hi to Todd for me. And I'd message Todd and he'd be like, oh my God, say hi to him. But <laughs> Todd would never like make the first move to contact him or to walk up to him. It was a very, it was like classic high school crush situation. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but that's what I love is that I, th- I think so am I wrong to glorify him? I think Which you're, I definitely am. I think you're like a butterfly or a frog or one of those like ecosystem measuring species what? that you can tell who should really be glorified. If I introduce you to a range of people from like media stars to like PhD <laughs> students to like people who work in the field and you don't know a single person, they have no value to you and you can judge like purely on the merit of what you think they're like. Yeah. You should be glorified. And out of everyone you met in Indonesia, like some big names, some field staff, Lahiri was the one that you still remember. <laughs> <laughs> still holds you in his heart. Yeah. Definitely the most impressive guy. It is beautiful. <laughs> it just makes you contrast. I'm glad you think I have this power because we were just watching like beauty guru YouTuber drama. And there's a lot of beauty gurus who do gurus. not... Im- gurus. <laughs> gurus. They do not impress me in the slightest, and they look like complete wankers. <laughs> just looking at it for ten seconds, I just oh, what a what a terrible human being. But like, they're really famous, and a lot of people love them. So, are you saying that like, even you, you think of like uh, Steve Irwin, where a lot of people have some gripes with him that he would just pick up an animal and like yell at its face, and <laughs> crikey, and it taught a lot of people that it's it okay. does seem rude to the animal. It's like it? okay to disturb wildlife. It's okay to walk up to a snake and pick it up and just like show it around. Like some people have issues, and personally, I kind of do as well. I <laughs> never really idolized him because of that. the general public think he's a saint. Yeah. So are you saying that like at least that at least when people glorify someone in the conservation industry despite all their flaws they're at least still contributing something to the world instead of just living in a mansion producing videos on lipstick. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Not much more impressive to me. <laughs> That's so interesting because like I guess it depends, like, it, it depends what you're passionate about. I can imagine people who are really passionate about makeup who find a really, who find value in seeing how it's applied and they, like, makeup is expensive, right? So you can't afford to test everything and if you're going to invest... Well, this is what you tell me, like, no, Todd, he's not a complete wanker. No. He knows a lot about makeup no, and that's valuable. I can say that, like, a lot of them are wankers and they're rich now, they've probably lost touch with reality. There's a glorification, <laughs> right? Like they're probably like nothing probably sets them apart from an underground um, makeup artist who never put themselves on the internet. Just because they're not as famous doesn't mean they're not as good. Mm. Um, but there is some value in what they offer on a like if you're a, an enthusiast, right? Because it's expensive, you might not have the money to make these comparisons or to test everything yourself. So if you can listen to somebody else's review it might be valuable but there's a lot of people watching the content that don't even use makeup who are just looking at for entertainment value so they might not be getting anything that positively like contributes to the world or their skill set or their life i don't know like people get things like some people might love watching steve Irwin, but then still like eat Maccas and chuck the wrapper out the window. (laughs) Like, how do you know that somebody's actually influenced you, even though you're an influencer? Yeah. Well, people just don't see the connection, do they? Can I tell you something? (laughs) I really hate, I really hate... Oh, spilling the tea. ...when people call me an inspiration. An inspiration? Unless... Do people call you that? Yeah, and it shits me. What? (laughs) Unless they say exactly what I've inspired them to do. Because I think it's like, oh, like a, a false statement. Just a general yeah. inspirational It's annoyed me vibe. to the point where people, when they say I'm an inspiration, I ask, what did I inspire you to do? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that that word is so powerful and it shouldn't be used lightly. Do you not think you're an inspiration? No. <laughs> I can understand that Like, there's instances where I can tell I have inspired some people. Like my old friend who I went to primary school with she was on Kentucky or something and she didn't ride elephants and she stayed back everyone after asked her why she didn't and she's like oh 
my friend works with elephants. She said, it's really bad and damaging for this, this and this ways. And they're like, why didn't you tell us this before? Like, we <laughs> wouldn't have ride it also. But the fact that she didn't ride them and she had that conversation with the people on the trip, I had inspired her. She would have ridden the elephants otherwise. And yeah. I can acknowledge that I inspired her behavior. But if I just... And what really shits me as well is like, I could work so hard at something that's so meaningful and get zero credit, but I could like do something that just looks good and it didn't take me any effort and I could get so much praise for it and I'll get mad because I'm getting praise for something that didn't really contribute much to the world in my opinion. I think I remember you complain about this. <laughs> you just, yeah, do something a bit throwaway. Just say something and be like, oh, it's so great you said that. You're like, well, everyone can say it. This is kind of like an interesting thing. I want to hear your opinion. So the other day I posted a story on Instagram saying... I feel really bad because we're not able to do the last Lonely Conversationist for the year. And it was supposed to be on Indigenous people and colonization, which mm -hmm. I think is really, really important. And I said I felt bad because I don't want to be seen like I'm just promoting a lot of white people and I'm like playing into the problems of um, conservation. And it's well, so... Well, look at you. You have to... <laughs> I, uh... you, if there's one you're not going to bother with, it's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's what I felt Aboriginals. like. I felt... But... The problem is that there's so many projects going on. The speakers are busy. I just felt this insane guilt that I'm not able to do this. Like, this is the one that's missing out. Yeah, it's and a bit of a shame. So I told people, like, I'm so sorry we're not able... They wouldn't have known otherwise, but I just felt bad, so I had to say. Like, <laughs> I'm so sorry we can't do this Indigenous and colonization talk. It was... I know it's one that's so important to a lot of people. It's so important to me. Unfortunately, the speakers are busy. We've got a lot of projects going on and this one will have to be postponed to next year. And then people started messaging me like, Jesse, you're so amazing, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but I, I didn't do something. Like I say, well, I'm... I thought you celebrate failures. I know, but I'm just like, I'm not doing this. And they're like, Jesse, you're so great. And I'm like, but I just said I'm not doing something. Yeah. <laughs> How great you're not doing this. I'm here, like, well, hang on. I'm here feeling so terrible that this is the one that is getting left out. Yeah. And people are praising me for that. And I just feel weird about Compared it. Compared to like you posting like, here's a new blog about the blah, blah story. It's really incredible. Please read it. Yeah. And it's like, no one says, wow, that's amazing. I can't thank you so much for sharing this story. They only say that when, when you I'm say, actually, we're going to deny these people <laughs> the yeah. ability to share their story. Like, oh, that's great. That's tr I didn't even think of it that way. Like, I'll post a lot of blogs. I'll Like, the conservation optimism one that I posted, we posted the whole discussion. Yeah. Nobody's saying, thank you so much for posting this. <laughs> You're, like, really great for giving us this opportunity. Yeah. Nothing. It's just when I say, I'm so sorry, I can't do this, and I feel bad about it. That they're yeah. like, oh, you're so amazing for even thinking of doing <laughs> I wonder how much that's, like a human level what captures their attention or even just like an algorithm social media bias or what gets people to comment mm. like it's easier to comment on something if it's like just a post versus a whole video or like yeah if just it's just like the post structure. you'd be like okay like i can press comment but if you like post a blog people click on it and now they're on the blog and then they finish reading the blog and there's no like immediate button to comment back on your original <laughs> post for the blog you know what I mean? Yeah, but I just, like, I guess my point is it just feels weird that I'm getting praised for not doing something, you yeah. know? And I it, guess... It that feels misplaced to you. In their brain, they're complimenting me or they're praising me because I have an intention to do something. <laughs> but for me, that's not really, like, I feel bad that I'm being rewarded for not doing something or to just having an intent to do something. And the stuff that I am doing is not getting that reward. This is not me complaining, mm. but it's just like something that I notice that kind of makes me a bit mad that there's so many people doing so much amazing work and it might be small scale or they might talk about it but it doesn't get that much attention and the stuff that is like sorry whoopsie daisies we missed this opportunity like that is getting praise yeah um it happens a lot in my life where <laughs> um so there was a media article that I was not happy with and I felt really miss misvalued what is it called like misrepresented. Mis misrepresented and it was posted by someone on facebook and a lot of their friends and family were like oh my god jesse's such an inspiration 
like, <laughs> a classic word. I would not think that if I read this article. Like, it doesn't make me feel good on the inside. But this could be me harshly judging because, like, when you're so in-depth in something, like, you don't really... You, you're too nitpicky. I think I remember that article. It was a lot more, like, general talking about your what you're about. They that spell- you were, like... Oh, they got this exact detail wrong. They spelled this my wrong. name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, details. <laughs> but, like, the gist of it was still... I guess it's fine. ...positive and, like, sort of representing but, what you're like, about. But, like, if you just say, if it's, like, okay, somebody's mother that I haven't seen since I was a kid and they comment on that article, like, Jesse is such an inspiration. Okay, Deborah, what have I inspired <laughs> you to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like... How have I really changed your life I would love I don't think I wrote about this in the book but I'd love this to be a takeaway of this podcast if you ever tell or comment on somebody's thing that they're an inspiration tell them why I think this is just something that triggers you like when people say oh what's next in your life yeah you just (laughs) do not react goodly to it goodly I do not (laughs) react goodly but like I like really encourage everyone to tell people when they inspire you because that's huge that's amazing you should be telling people but don't use it loosely and actually tell people how you're inspiring them because if now that i know that me talking about uh, elephant cruelty can actually have some tangible like behavioral change in people's lives that will encourage me to keep talking to people about elephant cruelty but like if she just said you inspire me Ooh, I don't know what to do. Like how? Like that's not constructive feedback, you know. <laughs> do you, I feel like you're the type of person who, if someone calls you awesome, you'd be like, "What do I truly, literally? Am I a in, mountain?" <laughs> cause you to, to feel awe. Well, my dad. You know, my dad is semantic. the biggest offender of that. He says everything's awesome. He's like, oh, "New coaster, it's awesome." New co- <laughs> It inspires awe. <laughs> but like, I'm not... Because awesome now is like a colloquial word people use, right? Yeah. But... I think it's the same for like Inspiration shouldn't be like that because it's so... You want to reclaim it back. It's so powerful, that word. Like, you are so powerful that you've inspired people to change. Like, everyone wants change. <laughs> and being an inspiration means you've achieved that. So That how, is peak conservationist. So how have I achieved that? Like, I'm a conservationist. It's my dream to achieve change. You've just told me I've achieved change. Amazing. My life goal. How? <laughs> so I can keep doing it. <laughs> you just want more constructive feedback around it. <laughs> if anyone knows Flight of the Concords, give me what? some constructive criticism. No, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Be constructive with your criticism, please. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's a good point like we want solution based here's the ways to overcome glorification one i think we should hype up the little people the anonymous people of conservation our field staff the underdogs the people who are not in the limelight but are doing incredible things i can get behind that the earthworms i think of them as the earthworms let's not go too far they're the most important animal in the world probably i don't know how much they will like this analogy but they're so underrepresented so maybe I need to tell this story. I've always wanted an earthworm tattoo. The problem is I can't find a picture of an earthworm that's like good Aesthetically enough pleasing. to be on my skin forever. And everyone's like, why? Why do you want an earthworm tattoo? Why? If I see so many people with bees, jewel beetles, really aesthetic animal, like really aesthetic insects mm. on their body and nobody's asking them why. They just accept that it looks cool to have a bee on your body. But... Like, for me, earthworms are so underrepresented. Like, they are so important for everything on the world, like, everything on Earth. Yet, like, people question their importance. And I think that's, like, lonely conservationists. Somebody's like, oh, your your worm tattoo is, like, lonely conservationists. Like, they're so important, yet so underrepresented. And I'm like, Mm. yes. So now in my brain, like, earthworms are a symbol for the underdogs that need to be glorified okay earthworms earthworms. represent yeah so i think like that is the first step into conquering glorification is kind of evening the scale and to actually giving credit where credit is due not just to hype up the people who already have a a lot of hype next step i think like don't just strive to be a figurehead if you want to be a figurehead what's your legacy 
Like, because if there's too many figureheads, what actual change is happening? So if you're the only person studying tardigrades, there probably needs to be a figurehead for tardigrades because a lot of people don't even know what tardigrades are. Um, but it's important that with your science communication, the money that you raise, it gets put into tardigrade research and you're actually continuing your legacy for tardigrades, you know? Okay. It's just a slight contradiction of yourself. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Like not every- I've ruined your flow now, sorry. <laughs> not everyone can be a figurehead. Like you need people doing the actual work. So yeah. before you strive to have like a billion followers on Instagram, what's your re- what's your real reason for it? What's your legacy and what are you what are, what are your actual outputs? Like why is it important for you to become influential or for your media content to be so publicized? So people know more about tardigrades. Tard- what's a tardigrade? They're like little bacteria right little water bears what what do you mean? <laughs> they're like bears are not little a eh? <laughs> they're microscopic little My- creatures and they how can, are they related to bears they can survive really extreme temperatures so they live in like underwater what are those like volcanoes like underwater volcanoes <laughs> <laughs> like they're really like high intensity crazy like ecosystems under the water they live there. also not like bears <laughs> <laughs> and then advice number three don't call anyone an inspiration unless you can say especially why especially jesse she would take it very strangely like if you call me an inspiration fine but how and why be precise be precise be constructive with your feedback <laughs> and i think like we don't have to have an anonymous conservation industry like it doesn't have to be anonymous it's great to know who's contributing and it's great to have representation and see all these amazing faces and people in the industry but we need to start evening the playing field and and talk about like the the realities of the industry i think we've gone too far into the the actual like hyping people up and not like how the industry is perceived which i guess i talk more about in the book so (laughs) <laughs> suss it out there um, but basically what we can do by sharing our stories in the blog and talking about the realities with solution based keeping it real keeping it real um, we can actually start to notify the general public of the reality of what's going on notify like employers that things need to change because we can't really tolerate working for free or paying to work in really shitty conditions forever like the more we talk about it and the more we give spotlight to the realities of the situation the more positive solutions can be achieved you know sure i guess that's advice number five if i got to five <laughs> i thought you got to four. Oh, well four whatever number <laughs> this is <laughs> um just keep it real um yeah so if you want to talk about like the things that are pissing you off have a solution um, so this is a good segue to plug the blog. If you want to talk about your real life in the industry, head over to the website, www.lonelyconservation.com. It has, to be, it has to be real and gritty though. It has to be gritty. You don't really have to have a solution in your blog because it's just talking about your life and that's enough. Like this, yeah. the solution comes from the collective mass. Yours doesn't have to solve every problem. And in fact, like there's one blog by Lorenzo, I think, and he's like, I don't have all the solutions. That's amazing because everybody else who doesn't have all the solutions is going to feel validated. So Mm. in your blogs, you can talk about how confusing and how crazy and how turbulent life is. And just by talking about that, it's going to give, especially like new people who are entering the industry, like students and early career scientists, it will give them a good perception about what to expect. Um, Because I didn't have that growing up. I just, if you go into a glamorized field, you kind of think you have to be kind of famous to get anywhere, which is not the reality. Yeah. Just be a dude. <laughs> be a Lahiru. Everyone needs yeah. to be like Lahiru. We need more of them. Basically. Just like, just know if you are a nerdy dude who carries a bird book around and big binoculars, <laughs> yeah. there is a guy somewhere out there with a huge crush on you. Mm. You don't, He doesn't even like birds that much. 
but he respects you for it. I just respect the passion and craft, you know? Yeah, so if you're passionate about your craft, like, that's all you need. You don't need to prove yourself with all these followers or all this, like, false notion of glorification. Like, Todd's going to love you for your passion and your craft. (laughs) I'm sure other people beside Todd would as well. (laughs) Hopefully. So yeah, that was episode nine of How to Conserve Conservationist, all about glorification. Just remember, everybody poops. Just because you think someone is famous or amazing or incredible, doesn't mean they still don't have bodily functions, just like you or I. Um, So if you want to listen to stories of other people that poop, head over to the website at LonelyConservationist.com, follow us on Instagram at LonelyConservationist or Twitter at LonelyConserve, and even consider supporting us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash LonelyConservationist. And if you buy the book and read the book, consider rating and reviewing the book because that really helps me out a lot and I really want to hear what you think about it. So until next time, ciao. Thank you.